Welcome. Today we shall discuss supernovae and neutron stars. Every now and then, a new star appears in the sky. The Chinese studied them very diligently for over 2,000 years, and they call them guest stars. Here is an inscription in a Chinese oracle bone, which dates back to 1300 BC. And what this says is the following. On the seventh day of the month, a great new star appeared in the company of Antares. The Chinese recorded many guest stars, and they carefully studied their brightness as a function of time. Brighter stars appear bigger. That has to do with the response of our eye. So what they did was they used to hold a grain of rice at arm's length to provide them with an angular size. And they compared the size of the guest star with the angular size subtended by the grain of rice at arm's length week after week so that they could write down how the brightness of the guest star changed as a function of time. Extraordinary. Some guest stars could be seen for well over a year, and some even in broad daylight. The guest star of 1006 AD was especially bright, perhaps the brightest of the historical guest stars. The Egyptian astronomer Ali ibn Ridwan wrote as follows, The spectacle was a large circular body, two and a half to three times as large as Venus. The sky was shining because of its light. The intensity of its light was a little more than quarter that of moonlight. The guest star of 1054 AD, perhaps the most famous, as we shall see, of all guest stars, was studied in many countries, except India. The Native Americans even depicted them in their pottery and cave drawings. The great astronomer Tycho Brahe saw one in 1572. Tycho, of course, was a very great astronomer. So he actually plotted the light curve, namely the variation in the brightness of the guest star as a function of time, by comparing the brightness of the guest star with the brightness of well-known stars in the sky. And as we know, the brightness of stars do not change over a very short period of time. Therefore, today, we could use Tycho Brahe's diary and actually plot the variation of intensity as a function of time. And indeed, it is these light curves that have provided us the greatest insight into supernova explosions. Tycho called these guest stars Nova Stella, new stars in Latin. His student, Johannes Kepler, also saw a guest star in the year 1604, just four years before the telescope was invented. But the nature of the guest stars remained a mystery for a long time. In the year 1885, a guest star appeared in the Andromeda Nebula, what we now call as the Andromeda Galaxy. But till 1923, we did not know that this was indeed an external galaxy. But a guest star was seen in this nebula in the year 1885. Astronomical photography had not advanced to an extent that one could photograph this guest star in this external galaxy. But when a guest star appears in an external galaxy, the brightness of the guest star is often comparable to the brightness of the entire galaxy of about 10 to the 11 or 10 to the power 12 stars. 
Here is an example of a supernova that occurred in the galaxy NGC 4526 in the year 1994. You see how bright it is. We don't have a similar photograph of the guest star SS Andromeda of the year 1885. As soon as Hubble established that the Andromeda Nebula was in fact a galaxy in its own right at a distance of 3 million light years from us. Two astronomers, Walter Bode and Fritz Zwicky, in, in California Institute of Technology, wrote one of the most extraordinary papers, extraordinary and prescient papers, in the entire history of astronomy. And the paper was entitled Supernovae and Cosmic Rays. This is the first time the phrase supernova has ever been used in the astronomical literature. What Bader and Zwicky did was the following. They knew how bright the guest stars that occur in our galaxy were, because we have a light curve of Tycho supernovae and Kepler supernovae, but this was at a distance of 3 million light years. And therefore, if it was as bright as that at a distance of 3 million light years, it couldn't have been just any old Nova Stella. Indeed, Walter Barre and Fritz Wicke estimated that the energy released by the guest star of 1885 in this galaxy must have been comparable to the rest mass energy of a star. And they coined the phrase supernova because they estimated that the energy released in this event, whatever that may be, was comparable to the rest mass energy of a star itself of the order of 10 to the power 52 or 10 to the power 53 Earths. Now, Bada and Zwicky wrote as follows. If supernova initially are quite ordinary stars of mass similar to the mass of the sun, then the total energy release divided by c squared is of the order of m itself. Another way of saying is that the total energy release was of the order of mc squared, which is the rest mass energy of the star. Astonishing. So they wrote, in the supernova process, mass in bulk is annihilated. In addition, the hypothesis suggests itself that cosmic rays are produced by supernovae. Now in 1934, the details of the energy produced by the stars was still not known. Hans Bethe's paper was 1938. But there was this conjecture by Eddington dating back to 1920, that the energy release is due to transportation of hydrogen to helium. Now, what Walter Bale and Fritz Zucchi concluded was that the energy released in this event, the guest star of 1885, was so enormous that it could not have been due to any nuclear reaction whatsoever. It must have been due to mass in bulk being annihilated and the energy mc squared being released by an unknown process. So they concluded with this extraordinary statement. With all reserve, we advance the view that supernovae represent the transitions from ordinary stars into neutron stars, which in their final stages consists of extremely closely packed neutrons. This was in the year 1934. Just a year and a half earlier, Chadwick had discovered the neutron. What they tried to say is perhaps the following. There is a gaseous star like the sun with a radius of about a million kilometers or 10 million kilometers. And it somehow collapses to a very small star. And when it collapses in its final state, it consists essentially of closely packed neutrons. And its size will be a mere 10 kilometers in radius. 
and its density will be 10 to the power 14 grams per cubic centimeter, which is the density of atomic nuclei of all the elements in the periodic table. This is absolutely extraordinary. Why should the star of 10 solar mass collapse to a mere 10 kilometers in radius from 10 million kilometers in radius? And what happened to all the protons and what happened to all the electrons? Why should this final state consist of merely closely packed neutrons? They had no answer because there was no answer at that time. Let us see what happened between the year 1932 and the year 1937. Chadwick, one of Rutherford's students, discovered the neutron in 1932. Late in 1934, the great Enrico Fermi advanced the theory of beta decay, namely, a neutron decays to a proton plus an electron plus a neutrino. Today, we know that this should be an anti-neutrino, but that doesn't matter. This was a revolutionary statement by Enrico Fermi, because what you, there are no electrons inside the atomic nucleus of a radioactive element. There are no neutrinos inside the atomic nucleus. So the electron and the neutrino are spontaneously created in this radioactive decay. For example, when an atom jumps from a higher energy level to a lower energy level, it emits a photon. There is no photon inside the atom. But a photon is spontaneously created. In a similar fashion, Enrico Fermi asserted that the electron and neutrino are spontaneously created in beta decay. Now the scene shifts to Moscow in Russia, where the great Russian theoretical physicist Lev Landau, at that time a very young man, advanced the idea of a neutron star, which Walter Bardet and Fritz Wicke had advanced in 1934, but they had absolutely no scientific basis for advancing that hypothesis. The idea of neutron matter, the state where all the nuclei and electrons have combined, all the protons have combined with all the elect uh, uh, electrons to form neutrons, was suggested first by Hund, the chemist, in 1936. But the reaction, proton plus electron going to a neutron and a neutrino, is strongly endothermic. You have to supply energy for this reaction to happen. For example, if you want to transform one gram of normal matter, which consists of neutrons, protons, and electrons, to entirely neutrons, it will cost you an astronomical amount of energy, almost 10 to the power 19 Earth, which is an enormous amount of energy. So Landau, in the year 1938, built on Hund's idea and argued that a neutron star could be stable if the body was sufficiently massive. The idea was, yes, it is true that you will need an enormous amount of energy, 7 times 10 to the power 18 energy, just to convert 1 gram of ordinary matter to neutron star. Imagine converting an entire star into neutron star. You will have you will need an enormous amount of energy, an unimaginable amount of energy. Where do you get this energy from? Landau said, if you have a sufficiently massive body, then its gravitational binding energy, G m squared divided by R, which is attractive and therefore has a minus sign in front of it, could be the compensating source of energy. What did he actually mean? One picture is worth 10,000 words. Here is a star consisting of electronic matter, protons and electrons, and of course, neutrons. When the density increases beyond 10 to the power 11 grams per cubic centimeter, 
Why should the density go from 1 gram per cubic centimeter, which is the density of sun, to 10 to the power 11 grams per cubic centimeter? That's a different story. That's the story of white dwarfs and the Chandrasekhar limit. So when a white dwarf approaches a mass of 1.4 solar mass, and it's contracting and contracting and contracting, and its density increases, its density is in fact of the order of 10 to the power 11 grams per cubic centimeter. So what Landau said was at that density, matter will get neutronized. Protons will combine with electrons to form neutrons and emit a neutrino, which will of course escape carrying energy and entropy. And the result will be neutron matter, which consists of matter at a density of 10 to the power 14 grams per cubic centimeter. Now you have said this is all science fiction. There cannot be matter at 10 to the power 14 grams per cubic centimeter. Friends, this is not science fiction. You and I are made of matter whose density is around 2.5 times 10 to the power 14 grams per cubic centimeter because that is the density of atomic nuclei from helium all the way to uranium or what have you. We float in water because our average density is less than one. And that is because these atomic nuclei are so spaced so far apart that the average density is of the order of one of the human body. But the density of atomic nuclei is in fact 2.5 times 10 to the power 14 grams per cubic centimeter. According to the modern picture, which we discussed at great length when we discussed the life history of stars, a white dwarf forms at the center. It could be a carbon-oxygen white dwarf. And over the period of time, the mass of the white dwarf will increase. And as the mass increases, the central density will increase because this core will be degenerate. And according to Chandrasekhar's theory of white dwarfs, the mean density will increase as the square of the mass. And when the central density reaches 10 to the power 11 grams per cubic centimeter, neutronization will set in. When neutronization sets in, electrons begin to disappear because protons and electrons combine to form neutrons. Now this has a disastrous consequence for the star because this will lead to a contraction of the star. Why? The star was supported, or the core of the star was supported by the degeneracy pressure of the electrons. The degeneracy pressure of the electron is proportional to density to the power 5 by 3. Therefore, if you take away electrons, the density of electrons decreases, and therefore the degeneracy pressure decreases, and therefore there will be an acceleration of the neutronization of matter, and there will be a positive feedback, and there will be a dynamical collapse. So this is what Landau had in mind in 1938. When a star, when the core of the star collapses to a mere 10 kilometers in size, and it becomes a neutron star with a radius of mere 10 kilometers in size, and a density of 10 to the power 14 grams per cubic centimeter, then the energy release which is different from the gravitational binding energy gm squared over r of the initial configuration minus the gravitational binding energy gm squared over 10 kilometers of the final configuration, that energy release is of the order of 0.1 mc squared, where mc squared is the rest mass energy of the core. So this is what Walter Bauer and Switzuki had conjectured four years earlier, even though they had no proper scientific basis for making this conjecture. So the energy released in this process is comparable to the rest mass energy of the star, and that results in the supernova explosion of the envelope of the star. So that is the connection between the formation of a neutron star, the gravitational binding energy release, which in turn goes to exploding the rest of the star. So here is the extraordinary statement made four years earlier, 
by Walter Body and Fritz Wicke. With all reserve, we advance the view that supernovae represent the transitions from ordinary stars into neutron stars, which in their final stages consist of extremely closely packed neutrons. Of course, the theoretical basis for a gravitational collapse was there in Chandrasekhar's theory. But Walter Bonnet and Fritz Wicke make no reference to Chandrasekhar's paper, which had appeared already earlier, admittedly in astronomical literature, but perhaps they were not aware of it, or they just didn't bother to quote it. Now, I'm going to tell you a remarkable story, a scientific fairy tale, the remarkable story of the Crab Nebula, which is over there. Hubble established around 1920 that the Crab Nebula is in fact expanding with a velocity of about 1,500 kilometers per second. He established this by studying the spectrum of the filaments and the lines he could identify were Doppler shift. And from the Doppler shift, he concluded that these filaments were expanding from the center of the nebula. But this picture is not Hubble's picture. This was done much later, I think, by the famous astronomer Virginia Trimble around 1968. What is done in this is a superposition of two photographs of the Crab Nebula taken 10 years apart. One is a positive image, the other is a negative image. If the nebula was not expanding, if you put a positive and negative, they will precisely cancel each other and you will not see anything. But if one of them was taken 10 years later, and if the nebula is expanding, the positive and negative images will not cancel out each other. And that's what you are seeing in this very remarkable picture. This structure tells you that it is um, expanding. Now let us closely look at the guest star of the year 1054 AD. The moment Hubble discovered the expansion, the great Dutch astronomer Jan Oort collaborated with some Dutch historians in the University of Leiden and they studied the Chinese historical records of guest stars. They studied the, guest, the, the records of the guest stars in the last 2000 years which the Chinese had meticulously recorded and they established that the center of the Crab Nebula coincided with the guest star of the year 1054 AD. And therefore, they concluded, Jan Oort and his historian collaborator concluded that the Crab Nebula must be the expanding remnant of the supernova explosion of the year 1054 AD. The Crab Nebula was a rather extraordinary object. In fact, there had been no other object in, the, in astronomy. There were two kinds of emissions at, at optical wavelengths. One was line emission. In other words, what the features that you see here, if you send the light from this to a spectrograph, prism or a grating, you saw emission lines corresponding to various elements which, were, which the star ejected when it exploded. But there is also a continuous emission, featureless continuous emission, which sort of looks like a fried egg or an omelette. This had no emission lines or absorption lines. Here is a modern picture taken with the Hubble telescope of the Crab Nebula. You see the filamentary emission, which is line emission. And you see right at the center a bluish, amorph bluish amorphous optical emission. That is what was shown in the previous slide as the continuous emission. So this shows both of them very, very clearly and distinctly. There is another important difference between the line emission and continuous emission. The line emission is not polarized. It is thermal emission and therefore it cannot be polarized. But the continuous emission, whatever that is due to, is strongly linearly polarized. So here you see 
depending on the orientation of the polaroid you see the direction of polarization is different it indicate that the, the continuous emission is very strongly linearly polarized not only polarized but linearly polarized now let's go to the year 1942 soon after jan ort and his collaborators had concluded that the crab nebula was with the expanding debris of the supernova explosion of the year 1054 what do you expect the expanding debris the expanding debris initially will expand according to newton's first law the constant velocity and slowly it will slow down and it will decelerate but what we found they found that these elementary structures were not expanding with a uniform velocity they were in fact accelerating walter bonnet was an extraordinarily outstanding astronomer in the year 1942 he did the following he tried to extrapolate backwards the velocity vectors of various filaments and what would you expect you would expect these velocity vectors to meet somewhere near the center of the nebula in the year 1054 ad when the star actually exploded but that's not what walter bode found when he extrapolated the velocity vectors backward it did meet near the center but not in the year 1054 ad but 80 years later now this is very extraordinary why should the debris be accelerating if you throw a stone up it must slow down suddenly if you find the stone actually accelerating that only happen that can only happen if something is pushing the stone against gravity so what is causing this acceleration so let's see what what about i concluded let us consider uniform expansion of the nebula then you will find that the radius of the nebula as a function of time will expand like that but on the other hand if the nebula were decelerating then the radius as a function of time will be a curve like this so if you took some point and drew a tangent to it which is the velocity of the filament at that instant of time let us say in the year 1942 and if you extrapolate the tangent it will meet in a year before 1054 ad because the nebula is decelerated it was not always going with the present velocity it was going faster in the past therefore this will meet earlier than 1054 on the other hand if the nebula is accelerating then the curve will be like this and if you drew a tangent to it which is the slope which is the velocity in the year 1942 when walter bode made this extraordinary statement then that tangent met 80 years after 1054 around the year 1130 so this is how and this is why bode concluded that the crab nebula is in fact accelerating then you also notice one thing this is the star at the center of the crab nebula he found that every now and then there was some violent activity near the star there were expanding wisps you notice that the, all this feature is not there in the photograph in the left taken perhaps a few months earlier so there was something live happening the location of the central star of the nebula walter bode concluded that not only the nebula is accelerating he conjectured what could be the cause of this acceleration something must be pushing the nebula outward he wondered if there could be some kind of a wind wind from what wind emanating from the stellar remnant of the supernova explosion of 1054 in the year 1942 no astronomer in the world believed that there were stellar remnants of supernova explosions indeed people didn't even believe in the notion of a supernova explosion of a star at that time except a few persons like 
Ritsuki and of course Walter Bode because they had invented this notion. But Bode and Ritsuki knew that the very cause of this explosion was the formation of a neutron star at the center which he called as a stellar remnant. So he said some kind of a wind must be coming from the stellar remnant which is pushing and accelerating this nebula. Pure science fiction of course. And he pointed to the central star where the wisps were emanating from. In the year 1949, a very famous radio astronomer by the name John Bolton, working in Sydney in Australia, discovered radio emission from the Crab Nebula. Till that time, the only source from which radio emission was known was the sun. And that was a secret during World War II. But John Bolton discovered that there is at least one more source namely of radio emission, namely the Crab Nebula. Then his colleagues discovered one other source, but that's a different story. We will come to that when we discuss radio galaxies. Now, as soon as the radio emission was discovered by John Bolton, the great astrophysicist Shklovsky, working in Moscow, speculated that the continuous optical emission, remember the continuous fried egg-like featureless optical emission, as well as the radio emission that had just then been discovered, might be synchrotron radiation from relativistic electrons gyrating in the magnetic field. Please remember, at that time, around 1954-1955, Synchrotron had just been made by Lawrence in Berkeley in California. But no one ever thought there were astronomical sources which produce relativistic electrons and which had strong enough magnetic fields to produce synchrotron emission. But Shklovsky was saying precisely that. Now he also predicted that if the radio emission from the Crab Nebula is in fact due to synchrotron radiation, then it must be very strongly, linearly polarized, like the continuous radi optical radiation from the Crab Nebula is already known to be strongly, linearly polarized. So he predicted that the radio radiation must be strongly, linearly polarized. Why? Remember my lecture on radiation from accelerating charges? The radiation from a relativistic electron gyrating in a magnetic field will be beamed in the forward direction in a narrow cone whose opening angle is 1 over gamma, where gamma is 1 over square root of 1 minus b squared by c squared. Gamma is very large, therefore 1 over gamma is very, very small, and therefore there is a very narrow cone. Therefore the radiation is essentially confined to the plane of the orbit and the radiation will be 100% linearly polarized, and the plane of polarization will be the plane of the orbit. So I hope you remember all these things. So a Russian astronomer went and measured, looked for polarization for the Crab Nebula, and he found that the Crab Nebula radio emission is very strongly linearly polarized, just as Klovsky had predicted. What you see are these things which you cannot see very clearly. These are the directions of the electric vector, and of course the magnetic field vector will be perpendicular to that, indicating that there is a pattern of orientation of the electric field, which is the signature of strongly linearly polarized radio radiation. And as I said, the continuous optical emission in the visible wavelength is also strongly linearly polarized. In the year 1962, a couple of astronomers in MIT in Boston fired a suborbital rocket. And when the rocket was above the Earth's atmosphere for just a few minutes, they detected X-rays. Fortunately, at that time, the Crab Nebula was being occulted by the Moon. So they used the lunar occultation technique to pinpoint the direction from which the X-rays were coming, and they concluded that there was X-ray emission from the Crab Nebula. This is the first source ever known from which astronomical source from which X-rays were detected. And then Sklovsky made an even more atrocious prediction. He said 
that the X-ray emission must also be due to synchrotron radiation. So in other words, for Slotsky, the radio radiation, the visible radiation, and the X-ray radiation, they're all due to synchrotron radiation. Since X-ray emitting electrons will lose energy rather quickly, I'll explain this in a moment, Slotsky said that the relativistic electrons that are producing the optical radiation and X-ray radiation cannot be from the supernova of 1054 AD. Remember the title of Walter Bade and Fritz Wicke's paper was Supernovae and Cosmic Rays. They said cosmic rays are produced in supernova explosion. They are produced in supernova explosion. But Stroksky said those electrons wouldn't be around now to radiate in optical and X-rays. So he said there must be a continuous source of relativistic electrons in the Crab Nebula. They cannot be relic particles from the supernova. Then he made an even more atrocious statement. For synchrotron radiation, you not only need relativistic particles, but you also need a fairly strong magnetic field. Stars have magnetic field, therefore when a star explodes, the debris will have a magnetic field. But Slavsky says, ah, it cannot be that magnetic field. If I have a balloon in which there is gas, as the balloon expands, the gas will cool. It will lose energy. Now this could be a gas of particles, this could be a gas of photons. So photons will lose their energy and their frequency will be redshifted. Now a magnetic field or an electric field is like a photon field. Therefore a magnetic field will also decrease in strength due to adiabatic losses as the cavity expands. So Slotsky said, look, there must be a central engine inside the Crab Nebula which is supplying not only relativistic particles on a continuous basis, but it is also supplying on a continuous basis the magnetic field in which these particles radiate and produce the radiation that we observe. Now let's recall what we have learned before and try to understand what Slavsky said. In synchrotron radiation, the power radiated, the energy radiated per unit time, is proportional to gamma squared, square of the energy of the particle, square of the magnetic field, and inversely proportional to the mass of the particle. So protons don't count, only electrons radiate. Now let's try to understand the notion of synchrotron lifetime. Particles radiate energy. Where is this energy coming from? This energy can only come from the kinetic energy of the particle. Now you can ask, what is the time for an electron to lose a significant fraction of its energy? That time, which we shall call a synchrotron lifetime, is the energy of the particle divided by the rate at which it is losing energy. Remember what we said before? If you have a certain amount of energy in your bank account, and every time you visit the ATM and withdraw money, the time for which your money will last in your savings account is the money you have in that account divided by the rate at which you are withdrawing money. So this is the time scale over which the particle will lose a significant fraction of its kinetic energy and therefore can no longer radiate. Now if I take that expression for dE by dt from the previous slide, then I get this expression on the right hand side. Please do not bother about the algebra there. Just listen to the argument that I am making and I am not bothered about this algebra. You can go back and play the video back once again and look at it carefully. Now this can be written, this synchrotron lifetime can be written instead of in terms of the magnetic field and the energy of the particle gamma, it can be written in terms of the characteristic frequency at which the particles radiate. Remember, Every relativistic particle, it radiates a continuous spectrum of radiation because the radiation is pulsed and Fourier transform of a pulse is a broad power spectrum. But the power spectrum peaks very strongly at a characteristic frequency which is gamma cubed times the gyration frequency. So it's at a very characteristic frequency. 
And that formula is that the frequency at which the maximum energy occurs is proportional to B gamma squared or proportional to the gamma cube times the gyration frequency. So I can write this formula for the time over which the electron will lose a significant fraction of the energy. Instead of that form, I can write it in terms of the strength of the magnetic field and the frequency at which it radiates. So remember, particles which radiate at radio frequency do a small, will have small energies, will have small gamma. Particles which radiate X rays and gamma rays will have very large gamma. Therefore, the lifetimes will be very different. The Crab Nebula is filled with electrons and particles with all sorts of energies. The higher energy particles will lose energy more rapidly because they radiate X-rays and gamma rays. The low energy particles lose energy very, very slowly because they radiate only radio waves which carry hardly any energy. Therefore, the lifetime of the electron decreases with increasing frequency of observation of the Crab Nebula. And the lifetime decreases with the increasing magnetic field, which we will not bother about because the Crab Nebula has a fixed magnetic field at the moment. So let's take the Crab Nebula. If you use that formula, then you will find that the Crab Nebula's magnetic field is about 10 to the power minus 4 Gauss, very strong magnetic field. Then electrons which produce X-rays, the very high energy electrons which produce X-rays, will lose their energy in 10, 15, 20 years. So they couldn't have been produced in the year 1054 AD. Whereas electrons which radiate in radio wavelength, which is only micro electron volt per photon, they will lose energy only in millions and millions of years. So the Crab Nebula doesn't need a central engine to radiate in the radio, but it needs a central engine to radiate in the optical or visible wavelength, and certainly X-rays and gamma rays. Crab Nebula does emit gamma rays. So there is a great puzzle concerning the Crab Nebula. So let's gather the various uh, parts of the puzzle. What is causing the acceleration of the nebula that Walter Bauer discovered in the year 1942? What is causing these wisps emanating from the central star? What is continuing to supply relativistic electrons that are responsible for the optical and X-ray emission from the Crab Nebula? What is the origin of the magnetic field of the Crab Nebula? Again, that cannot be the relic of the supernova explosion of almost 1,000 years ago. The total luminosity of the Crab Nebula, radio, visible, infrared, X-rays, gamma rays, ultraviolet, everything put together, is about 10 to the power 38 x per second. A lot of energy. So there must be, according to Shklovsky, a central engine in the Crab Nebula that is supplying 10 to the power 38 x per second worth of energy and magnetic field. What is this central engine? So this was a great puzzle around the year 1967, when a young Italian astrophysicist by name Franco Piccini, who was at that time working at Cornell University in New York, made an absolutely extraordinary statement. He said, a rapidly spinning, strongly magnetized neutron star might be the central engine of the Crab Nebula. He wrote a very short paper in the journal Nature, very short paper, just a quarter of a page long, in which he made this extraordinary statement. Let's try to understand this statement. What are the expected properties of neutron stars? Remember, in 1967, neutron stars have not been discovered as yet. We know from theory that the mass of a neutron star will be 1.4 times the solar mass because when the carbon-oxygen core reaches 1.4 solar mass, it collapses. That is the Chandrasekhar limiting mass. 
We know that its radius must be about 10 kilometers. We know its mean density must be 10 to the power 14 grams per cubic centimeter. But we also knew prior to their discovery two other things. One is neutron stars will be very rapid rotators. This follows simply from the conservation of angular momentum. So here you have a star which is rather large of radius r1 spinning with an angular frequency omega1. It collapses to a small radius r2. Therefore omega2 has to be very much larger than omega1 because i omega which is the angular momentum of this rotating body must be a constant and moment of inertia is proportional to mr squared Therefore, omega 1 r 1 squared must be equal to omega 2 r 2 squared. And since r 1 is very large and r 2 is very small and it comes as square, this is only 10 kilometers in size. This is about many tens of thousands of kilometers in size. Therefore, omega 2 must be very large. So you expect a newly born neutron star to be spinning with a period of the order of several milliseconds. You also could have anticipated, and people did anticipate it already in the year 1964, that neutron stars will have very strong magnetic fields of the order of 10 to the power 12 Gauss or 10 to the power 13 or 14 Gauss. Why? When the core of radius R1 and with a magnetic field strength of B1 collapses to a smaller radius, the flux, magnetic flux is conserved. Because the core has very high electrical conductivity, the flux is concerned. What is flux? Flux is the number of magnetic field lines crossing a unit area. And since the surface area of this is 4 pi r1 square, and since the surface area of this is 4 pi r2 square, therefore b1 r1 square must be equal to b2 r2 square. Therefore, you can very easily conclude if this is of the order of many, ten, many uh, tens of thousands of kilometers, and this is a mere 10 kilometer, then even if the initial magnetic field was a very modest one Gauss or so, the resultant magnetic field of a newly born neutron star must be 10 to the power 12 to 10 to the power 13 Gauss. So this also, Pacini knew, must be the expected properties of the neutron star. He also knew the following, an oscillating charge will radiate, and this is Larmer's formula. The energy radiated per unit time is 2e squared by 3c cubed multiplied by the square of the acceleration, which can also be written as d double dot whole square, where d is the electric dipole moment, and d double dot is the second time derivative of the dipole moment. And if this dipole moment d changes as d0 cos omega t, then d dot squared will give me omega to the power 4 times d squared. Therefore, the energy radiated by an oscillating dipole will be proportional to square of the electric dipole moment multiplied by the fourth power of the frequency. This is Rayleigh's famous formula written in terms of wavelength is 1 over lambda to the power 4. This is the formula you use to explain why sky is blue. Now, a rotating magnet will also radiate because a uniformly magnetized sphere has a magnetic moment. And it doesn't matter according to Maxwell's theory whether it's an electric moment or a magnetic moment. Therefore, a rotating magnet will also radiate. And the luminosity of the radiation will be proportional to the square of the magnetic field and proportional to the fourth power of the frequency at which the star is spinning. So what Franco Pacini did was to use this formula to calculate what should be the luminosity, or rather, he knew what is the luminosity of the Crab Nebula, 10 to the power 38 x per second. So he conjectured, if the Crab Nebula had a central neutron star, which is spinning with a period of few milliseconds, namely omega is very, very large, and its magnetic field is in excess of 10 to the power 12 Gauss, then this formula will simply give me a luminosity of the order of 10 to the power 38 x per second. This was the content of that very short paper in Nature. So Pacini conjecture, 
that if there is a neutron star spinning with a period of a few milliseconds, no one knew of any astronomical body till then, which spins at a period of few milliseconds. Nor did any astronomer know of any astronomical body which is magnetized to a strength of 10 to the power 12 Gauss. But if there were such a monster at the center, then you could account for the radiation from the Crab Nebula. Because the total luminosity of the Crab Nebula is 10 to the power 38. This is the year 1967, around July, August of 1967, in Cornell University and Franco Pacini. Now let's go from Cornell across the Atlantic to England to the University of Cambridge, Cavendish Laboratory at the University of Cambridge. There, Anthony Hewish and his students were studying what is known as scintillation of radio stars or the twinkling of radio stars. You all know that stars in the sky twinkle at visible wavelength. That is because the Earth's atmosphere has a refractive index and the Earth's atmosphere is boiling. This causes the refracted rays to move around, which causes the twinkling in the eye. So if you had a radio star, and between the radio star and us, there are free electrons which give rise to a refractive index, either in the interplanetary medium or in the interstellar space, then if I had a point object emitting radio waves, it will produce scintillations as shown over there. What are these point radio stars? They are the newly discovered quasars. Quasars are not stars. They are enormous objects, as we shall see. They are supermassive black holes. But their angular sizes are like stars. They are point-like objects. So a young student by name Jocelyn Bell was studying using this radio telescope. It may not look like a radio telescope bunch of bamboo poles with wires. It is a low-frequency radio telescope. She was studying the scintillation phenomena of point radio stars. And she found a different kind of scintillation one day. That day was 6th August 1967. So here is what she found. She called that object 1919, which is the coordinates of the object. Let's not worry about the details, which I have shown inside the red oval. But normally, when you see something like that, it doesn't look very different from this. It doesn't look very much like that. A passing truck, the spark plugs from the truck, can cause a radio interference. So this she writes as an interference caused by some spark plug from a passing truck. But this one, some instinct told her, is not interfering. Although she had absolutely no explanation for what it was. Then the next day, this source didn't appear. And the next day, it didn't appear. So one day, many months later, on the 28th of November, 1967, this source reappeared. The rest of the, uh, her uh, classmates were having a party because some students had just graduated, got a PhD. But Jocelyn Bell was alone working in the radio telescope. And she discovered this object not only reappeared, but it seemed to emit pulses at periodic intervals, which may be seen better in this chart recorder tracing. She didn't know what it was. Then she went and told her professor, Anthony Huish, and then Sir Martin Ryle, who was the head of the radio astronomy group in the Cavendish Laboratory, clamped total secrecy about this discovery. They took six months from August to February when the paper finally appeared in the journal Nature. I remember the day Nature came to the library shelf. I was a student at the University of Chicago at that time. It was February 1968. 
the authors of the paper, there are several authors, were Anthony Hughes, Jocelyn Bell, et al., and others. That paper was a masterpiece, a sheer masterpiece. Everything that could have been said was indeed said. What was the final conclusion of that paper? Twinkle, twinkle, little star. They concluded that it must be a very small star, either a white dwarf or a neutron star. These were the only two small astronomical bodies that one had heard of. Besides planets, this couldn't be a planet. Soon after that paper appeared, a pulsating star was found at the dynamical center of the Crab Nebula, right there at the tip of that arrow. This was spinning so fast at a period of 33 milliseconds, it was rotating once every 33 milliseconds, that instantly they knew this could not be a white dwarf. A white dwarf spinning at 33 milliseconds will simply explode due to centrifugal forces. It had to be a neutron star because it had to be far more compact and far denser than a white dwarf. And then somebody had a very clever idea of just using a television camera pointed towards the Crab Nebula and take a video, a simple video. And there, this astronomer found a star right at the center was pulsating with a period of 33 milliseconds, on and off, on, twinkle, 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 once every 33 milliseconds. What was most extraordinary was the star that was twinkling or pulsating was the, precisely the star that Walter Bade had pointed to in the year 1942 and said, this must be the stellar remnant of the supernova explosion and some wind from this must be causing the acceleration of the nebula. We'll come to that in the next lecture. What is this wind and how it accelerates the nebula? So the discovery of a neutron star at the dynamical center of the Crab Nebula solved a long-standing puzzle concerning the central engine that powers the nebula in which Shklovsky had conjectured in the 1950s. There are the pulses from the Crab Nebula. It pulsates in radio, optical, X-rays and gamma rays. What are the characteristics of the pulsar? Its rotation period is 33 milliseconds. Its magnetic field is 5 times 10 to the power 12 Gauss. Its energy loss rate, which is equal to B squared omega to the power 4, is 10 to the power 38 per second. This is precisely the luminosity of the Crab Nebula, and the great mystery about the Crab Nebula was finally resolved, and Franco Pacini was right after all. I hope you will agree that this was an incredible fairy tale in science. I know of no other story like this. The great Dutch astronomer Jan Oort, whose name you have encountered several times already in these lectures, said, Astronomy is divided into two halves, the study of the Crab Nebula and the rest of the universe. So more papers have been written about the Crab Nebula than any other astronomical body. So that is the Crab Nebula with the central neutron star. There is the Chandra Observatory X-ray image of the central pulsar emitting wind that Walter Bode was talking about. And the wind is radiating X-rays. We shall discuss this in the next lecture, which will be on pulsars, these pulsating neutron stars that Jocelyn Bell discovered in August 1967. Thank you very much for your attention.